series. And you can get the latest by following us on social media. We're on Facebook and on Twitter. And becoming a Greenspot member at ColumbusGreenspot.org. Uh, you'll receive our e-newsletter and our members get a heads up before the general public does about the Greenspot conversations. So I'd like to introduce today's topic, Eating Greens for the Planet. Uh, we know that uh, what we eat can make us healthy or sick, and likewise, the food choices we make have different impacts on the environment. We have two great speakers today that will highlight an overview of how to grow your own food and what it is the carbon footprint of some foods versus other foods. So before I introduce our first uh, presenter, I do want to mention uh, with Greenspot is part of the city's Sustainable Columbus Initiative, where the goals of that initiative are to become a carbon neutral city by 2050, uh, to go 100% renewable energy um, provided by community aggregation by 2020, and to have prosperous neighborhoods with green space, clean air, and safe drinking water. When we think about sustainability, we really think about it when the environment, economy, and people, or equity, are all moving in the same direction. That's when you really have sustainability. Green Spot, many of you all already know what Green Spot is. It's a program the city started to encourage folks and businesses to go green. Uh, we provide a menu of options in which to do so and a lot of ideas. And we hold information sessions and Green Spot conversations like this one. I'm not going to read uh, what's up there on the screen because you can kind of see how many members we have and uh, some of the other programs. This is our collective savings. These are, are really underreported uh, because not all of our members track what they're doing or enter in the data, but you can see that in our green spot universe, we do have a positive impact. So with that, I do want to turn it over to Diane. Uh, she is with Sunny Glen Garden, and uh, she coordinates the garden, which shows folks that growing your own food in your backyard can be fun, simple, and cheap to start, easy to maintain and grow, and produce healthy, fresh food almost all year round. She turned her urban grass lawn into a vibrant, organic ecosystem and permaculture-based edible food forest that provides food and habitat for people, pollinators, and the planet. She only had to go to the grocery, or only go to the grocery shopping, how many times? Only four times in the last year, as the garden provided most of her needs. She'd been featured on various local news stations, and Sunny Glen Garden was presented with the Green Spot Light Award uh, from Mayor Ginther for demonstrating excellence in sustainable business practices. And as much as of what she has done has been inspired by green spot and information that was provided and really she is just kind of a, a superstar here on the local level uh, <laughs> with what she has done i'm going to put her on the spot and let me go ahead and change out the powerpoints here diane and um, all right well thanks so much for having me here today um I've really just been wanting to see what things I can do to be more eco-friendly and GreenSpot has been a huge part of that, um, creating that foundation and the information for me to kind of get going with all of it. And so just seeing what else I could do uh, as I just um, thought, well, what, you know, taking those same principles and ideas and seeing if I could take it a little further with how I choose to live. And so it never seems like very much, but when there are many people who are doing it, even just one or two of these things, it can have a larger impact, just like we see with the Green Spot programs. And for me, it had a lot to do with just, um, you know, saving money too, because at the time I wasn't able to afford a lot of things. And so, um, you know, these kinds of things came about because I didn't have the financial means to do that. And so, um, today, I think instead of, or maybe in conjunction with what you might do in terms of starting an annual vegetable garden, I'm hoping to be able to share some ideas of what we've done on our urban property with a perennial food forest, which means it comes back every year on its own. And so um, the yard has also become a certified wildlife habitat and Marnock Way Station, as I sort of found out more what was happening with our, our birds and our monarchs um, and just seeing you know, can I also just include them with what I'm doing in terms of growing my own food? And so the perennial food forest takes a, um, longer to get established because we're growing mainly shrubs and trees and um, things that take longer to, to grow up. But um, with this increased diversity of native plants instead of just a monoculture of grass, we now have enough insects and caterpillars that can support the birds. And besides enjoying their sing songs, they become a huge part of our organic pest management. And we've been able to grow 100% organically without the use of pesticides or herbicides. 
And so I don't, I don't think I realize how important this would be for self sufficiency. Uh, as I lost my all my income sources last year with COVID, but the garden, like <laughs> David had mentioned, provided most of my food this past year. And so, and also just working with the earth and being outside in the fresh air and sunshine just provided a lot of grounding for me. And so the photo that you see in this picture here is the edible food forest that's still a baby, but um, has a lot of the native plants that we've been incorporating. Uh, and on this little urban property here in North Linden area of Columbus. And I had zero experience growing anything. Like I was killing house plants still, but I've been learning along the way. So I'm hoping people to know that there are many resources out there to facilitate this for you. And you can get this going without knowing anything too. <laughs> All right. And so the next photo um, is the same um, backyard taken three er years earlier when it was lawn. And so basically, um, you know, I, I don't really like to mow and spending time doing that. So it was really nice to just let that evolve into what it was. So it took three years to get to the first picture that you saw and it continues to change each year because with a lot of the native plants and things, um, it's very dynamic. Um, so it doesn't sort of stay the same way each year, um, which I really love that aspect of it. And then just a little bit to go into why I decided to turn my lawn into growing food. Um, you know, just a lot of times the organic food was pretty expensive. And again, I was trying to find a means to do it. So growing it could be a lot cheaper, but also, um, you know, the lawn is considered like one of the largest single irrigated crops in America, like more than corn or wheat or fruit orchards combined. And to keep the grass alive, very often they say residents put 50 to 70 put five percent of their total water consumption on watering lawns and and there's like 36 billion dollars spent on lawn care uh, which is put towards millions of pounds of chemical fertilizers and pesticides uh, which is more than i think i don't know four and a half times the annual budget of the environmental protection agency and two of these chemicals commonly purchased by homeowners at nurseries um, were found to be the highest amounts of unwanted chemicals and the pollen of honeybees and so for me, just wanting to, you know, go mow high, keep it high because it provides more habitat. Um, the grass clippings are just composted right back into the grass, which provides 25% of its um, nitrogen needs. And so that just helps keep all of that um, in a way that works for me as well. And so the next photo, um, you know, I didn't realize too with the lawn mowers. I just didn't like it because it was so noisy. It's like anytime someone mows their lawn, it the rest of the neighborhood is subjected to the sounds of the blaring um, lawn mowers and things too. Uh, but also just realizing that you know we're using 800 million gallons of gas per year on just mowing our lawn in the in the lawn mowers and even just 17 million gallons of that gas is spilled while filling up lawnmowers, which is more than all the oil spilled by the Exxon Valdez in the Gulf of Alaska. And a lot of the garden equipment had unregulated emissions until the late 1990s. And so it was emitting a high level of carbon monoxide and some volatile organic compounds. And so, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that, you know, if a new gas gas powered lawnmower produces more um, volatile organic compounds and nitrogen oxides uh, and so operating that for one hour puts out puts out as much smog forming emissions as 40 new cars being driven for one hour and so just some of those facts and ideas really made me think about how i could do things differently for myself and um, and so my friend went to a battery powered mower, if you want to flip to the next one. And so I inherited her hand push mower, which I love. It's easy to use. There's no noise that I don't subject the, um, the neighbors to. And, um, and I did consider these other versions uh, of, of it here. Uh, my friends had some uh, goats that they would rent out to people to just really kind of eat and plow through areas of um, people's yards that they just wanted munched down when they get started on growing. So there's all kinds of ways to address it. And then the next one is for, you know, wanting myself, I really wanted to see what else I could do. And because I work on a computer at home, I needed more outdoor exercise. And I was considering for quite a while, like for a couple of years, if can I really live without a car? 
And so a couple of years, I, I decided I'm really going to do this um, because I went to a garden club and won a, a really nice, expensive bicycle. And so I had no more excuses. And so, you know, this bicycle and the cart became, you know, my bail buggy and tomato trolley, uh, you know, carted around my meditation cushion and yoga mats for classes and some purified drinking water, all my hay, hail bales. And so, you know, just found it was just a much healthier lifestyle for me. Buses have bicycle racks on the front, so I could pretty much get anywhere on the front and back end with my bicycle instead of taking, you know, the two hours. I have part of the carpooling or care and share time bank where I can um, donate services and then use that time credit towards anyone else. And so I used it often for transportation. So I found it made me much more efficient in terms of planning my trips and if I really need it or if it's just something that I would really like or want. Um, and it, so it helps save on gas and there's no more emissions. I don't have to pay for car, car payments or insurance. So all of a sudden, you know, a very simple lifestyle can go a much uh, longer way. Right. And then with the next one, um, this was also part of my healthier lifestyle too, because I had some health issues like the rest of my family with diabetic indicators, high blood pressure. Um, all of my relatives have died from heart attacks or cancer. So I also wanted to see what I could do to improve my own health situation. And so I was doing some um, Isha and yoga meditation with Sadhguru, um, which really just transformed so many things for me and because i had a daily set of practices it was really easy to observe the differences um, each day and some days my body would feel great and it would go really smoothly and easily other days my body would be so stiff and achy that um, i would just be so sore so all i did was see how my body felt and what i ate the day before and so that's how i kind of evolved to the choices of food that i was eating and it might not be the same for others but for me again meats i was just lethargic i would just feel like i couldn't stay awake i was you know and garlic and onions and caffeine made me more irritable and jittery i grew up on garlic and onions and i know they have medicinal qualities but i grew up on it every day and so eliminating that really made a difference for me and Preservatives and dyes and processed foods made me itchy with rashes, sugar just made, gave me mouth sores. And so basically all the things my yoga teacher had recommended that I do, um, but of course I didn't believe it because I kind of like, yeah, right, I need proof. Um, but so <laughs> I did my own experimentation. And so what could I eat? There we go with the next one. Um, so I felt so much better, more energetic eating fresh food, mainly greens. Um, and so, you know, traditional farming practices produce a lot of food for cheap, but the way it is done, you know, often depletes the soil of microbes and nutrients and these chemicals and sprays then that are needed to handle the pests when we have these huge monoculture of foods um, really destroys a lot of the essential microbes and um, in the soil and things like that. And then we have less nutrients in the soil, which means we have less nutrients in the food. And so I was buying a lot more organic, um, and but it was expensive. And then the next one, um, you know, I didn't know anything about gardening, but started with what I could grow indoors, which was microgreens and lettuces of pea shoots and sunflowers and so there was a lot of dishes I had in the winter with microgreens I grew indoors um, and it went on everything thrown on soup salads sandwiches and other dishes and it also eliminated buying or supporting the plastic packaging that salads and microgreens came in you know the the honey butt boat squash comes in its own container it stores really well it comes in a little individual portion and so I can save out the seeds and wash and dry them for next year all right, David. And so I found that with my daily yoga practices and eating more fresh foods and being outside in the garden, I felt a lot stronger and more flexible than I've ever been in my life. I need less sleep than I used to. I rarely get sick, even when others around me are sick. And so um, I'm just really happy to say that my health right now with my blood pressure, cholesterol, um, the polyps and things uh, are all I don't have any of those things and I'm all within what they consider normal limits. And so to take it to the next step, you know, growing my own food since I had this yard, turning this lawn into an edible organic food forest and wildlife habitat, it didn't, I didn't mean for this, but it sort of has become an educational demonstration garden for our community that continues to evolve as I learn more and observe how things grow. So 
you know, the observing life in the garden has just provided me with my most important life lessons. And so I think it would be wonderful if people can just grow a little more of these things. So I'll just talk briefly then here about just, um, you know, I'm not denying that there are, you know, some benefits to having a lawn um, because, you know, we know these urban heat island effects where city buildings and rooftops and road surfaces, you know, cre create more heat or you'll see how the rain when it goes over our city will kind of separate as it goes over the city and then um, rain before and after that. And so you can see a lot of these patterns. And so if we can help do this um, uh, and also just, you know, in our Linden area, when in the spring and summer, um, just climate wise with a lot of the increase in rain and climate change and flooding in our streets, you know, I had flooding in my backyard, so we'll talk about this too. So, but the permaculture food garden then comes back year after year. So there's no need to spend time and money buying new plants every year, planting them after they get established, they take very little maintenance and it creates these ecosystems that supports wildlife that is essential to um, the, you know, creature survivals as well as ours. So it provides that food for us and wildlife and, and can be better for the planet. And so hoping some of these ideas will uh, we'll come in there. But with that, that's just with the permaculture. And so this wintertime view that David's showing is just, um, just shows the property I have in red. Um, but the, and then the houses, the 864 square foot houses in blue, there's a, um, and then the, with the next one though, the summertime view makes it really apparent because I think it's important to take a look at your properties to kind of see what's there and how things grow. But as David goes through here, I think, I, th I don't know if it'll click David, like, um, yeah, so that's sort of the huge oak tree. I have a, uh, they say 175 year old pin oak tree, which is gorgeous and beautiful, but it takes up all the space or shade through there. And the next one um, is the maple tree in the front yard, which obliterates the front yard from sunshine. And then if you take it another one, there's a line of uh, trees from my neighbors and the building next door with the parking lot to the left there. And then at the end, there's my neighbor's two trees. Um, you can do the next one too, um, which is a walnut tree, which there are some juggalones in there. So, um, so there's not a lot of sun left in that little bitty part and what's left in the red. Uh, and so vegetable gardens usually require a minimum of six to eight hours of sunshine to get going. And so with all of this shade, there's really not much I can do. And so, you know, having this food forest, we're really trying to simulate, David, we can go to the next one, the forest canopy, where basically we can grow all of these plants and trees together because they're not competing with each other, but it's like coming to the edge of a forest where um, you have the tallest canopy, um, which for me is my chestnut tree and uh, or the oak tree as well. And then all of these other plants that we put in that will come back each year, um, seeing how they can be kind of combined or work together so that there's ground cover, you know, you don't need to weed or, or um, you know, it, it retains moisture in the soil and that kind of thing with that too. And so the idea of these food forest layers that they provide your food, you know, the, the branches and twigs that come out can be fuel or um, uh, fodder for things like that. You create your own fertilizer with the leaves of the trees that again, get recycled back in the ground. And so uh, the next slide will show what I grow in, you know, have has evolved with the Sunny Glen Garden, which they started as twigs. So you just need to make sure you know how big they will grow eventually <laughs> because, um, but they can grow well together in a minimum amount of space. And so my chestnut, the fruit tree, um, hazelnut bushes, raspberry, gooseberry, and currants all kind of simulate that forest canopy. So they don't compete, but they can grow well together and fit in this sort of 30 foot radius of my backyard. Um, and it does provide a lot of these things. So like the fruits this year, it took a little longer to get established or the fruits were the earliest to get established. But as you see then, you know, I have a lot of food that comes back in that first column of edible perennials every year uh, for me. And then I still have an annual garden, which I then rotate because that allows me to keep some organic, um, my organic pest management by rotating uh, the garden so that, and, and, 
putting them in groups of or families of plants that share the same pests and diseases. So when you rotate it and they don't grow in the same place more than once every four years, you don't get that buildup of our diseases or pests. And so that's a huge part of my organic pest management. And the next slide then, uh, I, I won't go to all, into all of those plants, but uh, just wanted to highlight a couple of things because with the pin oak tree, um, there are keystone plants that provide um, our hosts and provide what is needed for the most caterpillars or the birds that feed on them. And we're aiming for 70% native plants, trees and shrubs in our, our yards to be able to maintain base, you know, families of birds. And so in this, I, I allow, David, I don't know if the video will go on this, but basically these are the leaves that come down from my pin oak tree that I leave on the ground because many of these uh, insects or bugs will uh, create their cocoons in the leaves or when they drop down they'll burrow into the ground and so I don't like to um, mow up those leaves they stay on the ground and create that habitat or I'll just rake them onto my garden so that they can conserve the water through there uh, and so I don't have to water and then it also I don't have to weed because the it prevents the weeds from coming up and then the next photo everything kind of gets recycled in so all the the twigs and the trees that twigs, um, branches that come out of the trees um, become firewood or native bee habitat, uh, as many of them live under that. And then with the next photo, um, even just uh, we have a donated um, chimney that then is um, the ash can go on certain plants too with the nutrients from there. So everything's recycled back in. And then even from those branches, you know, the red wine cap mushrooms do really well in maple trees. The shiitake mushrooms do really well in the oak substrates. And so because I have the maple and oak tree in my yard, um, I just recycle those. And so um, growing my own mushrooms, you don't have to get the packages that they come in or the containers and wrap, um, plastic wrap. And with our climate change, like when we have a lot of rain like today, um, we can grow. And so David, you can just flip through the next few ones. These are like the apple tree and hazelnuts um, or acorns. And then the next one is just a lot of the, I think I pulled 25 or 30 pounds of raspberries and 15 pounds of strawberries. And these all go into what you'll see next is making jams that um, provided me all next year. Uh, and then when you realize that um, the next photo, we talk about, you know, it's estimated that the average American meal travels about 1500 miles to get from the farm to our plate. And so here, you know, just cutting down that transportation and the resources uh, with that can make a huge difference. And so, you know, everyone's always joking, they go out for fast food. And so my fast food is just stepping out into my backyard. And so I can um, move on here, uh, but just, if you wanna just, again, just flip yeah, through quick, quickly. Yeah, but... Yeah, Couple just minutes. because with the rain cistern collecting water so we can improve the water quality to prevent that runoff um, from the roof, which was donated. The next one is just turning, you know, our our sidewalk into having a little pocket prairie for our neighbors. And the next one, again, just all this diversity that comes, which is why we now have all these birds and also the big one where um, the next one where we had uh, an assassin robber fly, which is very rare and hasn't, uh, I think there's only been 10 sightings since um, 2010. And so it can really provide that diversity. Uh, and then there are other methods and things that we use, David, you can just keep flipping through there um, with the techniques of, you know, when our backyard would flood, we made the mulches or these swales so that it would capture the rainwater and drop it down into the garden instead of going away using recycled newspaper and cardboard, which eliminates the garbage from the landfill. Um, but that's just used to create our beds from grass to the garden beds. And, um, you know, we don't put out any leaves because we save them for our own fertilizer. Uh, and that's all done as well as with the, you can keep going, David, with the, um, that's our leaf corral. And so we just put the leaves right on the bed. And then we have, in, uh, you know, composting our kitchen scraps, which then provides us our free fertilizer. So this whole thing kind of goes, goes through. And the next photos, um, 
Yeah, so that I just took a picture of this today of what my the garbage and recycling was of my neighbors across the street today. I put out what you see in my hands. What I put out is once every four months right now because everything else can pretty much be recycled and I try and choose what I purchase or buy. And so the next photos are just some of the gardens um, integrating native plants and the food plants, um, having edible flowers. And we have a little food library that we've worked with our community and even our snacks that um, come in the garden, uh, all these different workshops we have and snacks so that it comes up. And basically we have a native plant sale so that we can fundraise to support some of our local community gardens with um, organically grown vegetable food that they can get out to their communities and areas that don't really have access to it. And so going from the uh, even snacks, so there's no, you know, paper plates or anything. We can just do it by hand with our barbecue blueberries and um, lettuce mandala, tatsoi mandala, the porcupine watermelon, you know, the veggie train. So even trying to look at snacks and that's our first garden. Yep, you can go. And then if you have any questions or we can save them maybe towards the end, but that's kind of just hoping to give you some ideas um, of what you can do in your own own yard and um, enjoy it as it is in the next photo. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. That's, that's such a success success story. I know we do have a couple questions, but we're going to wait till the end um, to get to those. Uh, and the, the other thing is, um, you know, it's like one of these things where the each of these topics we could probably talk for hours on, and I'm sure people <laughs> will have questions about about them too. So I apologize for kind of no, that's fine. Off here. Just, no, that's but uh, I do want to get to our other speaker. Um, so our next speaker is Stephanie uh, Feldstein, who is the Population and Sustainability Director at the Center for Biological Diversity, where she heads a national program that addresses the connection between human population growth, over overconsumption, and the wildlife extinction crisis. She created the innovative path, Take Extinction Off Your Plate campaign to promote, to promote diets that are healthy for people and the planet. She has a, holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan, even though we're in Columbus, we won't say anything about that, and has um, more than 15 years of experience in advocacy, outreach, and communications with a focus on animals and the environment. She is the author of the Animal Lover's Guide to Changing the World. And uh, Stephanie, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I was debating taking the University of Michigan piece out of my, uh, <laughs> out of my bio for So that was really impressive um, what, what Diane has been able to do. And I'm going to now take us to talk about this issue on really the planetary level. So um, to start with, you can go to the next slide. Um, just a little bit more background on, on me and the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, the center is a national wildlife conservation nonprofit. And we work through science, the law, policy, and creative media to protect wildlife and the places that they need to survive. And we also work on these underlying issues that are affecting wildlife and driving the extinction crisis. Things like, you know, climate change, of course, and our food system. Um, as David mentioned, I'm also the author of the Animal Lover's Guide to Changing the World, which is a book that's about all the different ways that our lives intersect with animal lives and things that we can all do in our everyday lives to try to make the world a better place, both for us and other animals. Um, so next slide. Um, today, we're going to focus on the environmental costs of meat and dairy production. Um, there are, of course, environmental costs to all kinds of industrial agriculture. But the footprint of meat and dairy production is really outsized compared to really all other crops. And um, it really, it's the most environmentally destructive industry on the planet because no matter what metric you're looking at, it's one of the leading causes of destruction. We're going to focus on the ones that are listed here today, um, the land use, water use, climate change, and biodiversity loss. There are a lot of other ones that we won't be able to get to, um, things like pesticide use and air pollution and, and many others. And I'll be moving through these pretty quickly because there's a lot of information and I wanna make sure that we 
you know, have plenty of time to talk about actions that you can take and to take your questions at the end. But I know that this presentation will be available. So um, you'll have access to some of the statistics that are listed throughout here, as well as my information, um, if you have any questions afterwards. Um, so next slide. To follow up, um, so land use and deforestation are, are major impacts of meat and dairy production. And when we talk about the amount of land that's used for meat and dairy production, we're talking about both the land where the animals themselves are. So that will include both factory farms and land that's used for grazing, as well as the land that's required to grow all of the crops that these animals need to eat. And so meat and dairy production are currently using up about 30% of the Earth's land surface and the vast majority of U.S. agricultural land. And it's also responsible for so much of the habitat destruction that we see. If you remember all the news about the wildfires that were happening in the Amazon, most of those were illegally set by people who were trying to clear forest area for pasture land or to grow feed crops, um, primarily for cattle. And when we talk about this land that we're losing, of course, we're not just losing these incredible ecosystems, um, but we're also losing the habitat for the animals who live there. And the leading cause of the current extinction crisis is the loss of habitat, because no matter what else we do to try to protect wildlife, if they don't have a place to live, they're not going to make it. And we know that historically, as well as it's projected into the future, that you know the greatest threat to wildlife will continue to be losing their habitat. And most of that loss is being lost to farmland, um, which again, the majority of which, which winds up being for agriculture, um, sorry, for feed crops or for um, pasture land for animals to graze, for livestock to graze on. Uh, next slide. Um, meat and dairy production are also major sources of water use. Uh, nearly half of all the water use in the U.S. goes toward meat and dairy production. And, and this other piece was, you know, was pretty surprising even to me when this study recently came out, that nearly a quarter of all of the water used in the U.S. is going just to grow feed crops, just for cattle, just in the Western United States. And so that means that that's having a massive impact on the, uh, on the river ecosystems that are in the Western United States, including those like the Colorado River, which uh, more than half of the water used in the Colorado River goes to these cattle feed crops. But that's not only a river that many, many species rely on, it's also a river that many cities rely on. I mean, huge cities in the West, like Los Angeles and Phoenix. So this has a very big impact on um, both wildlife and people, the amount of water that is going towards meat and dairy production. And it's not just those feed crops, though. Um, a lot of times with pasture, there's an assumption, you know, I think sort of like lawns that it's just grass that's out there. But like lawns, pasture land often needs to be heavily irrigated. Um, and of course, in addition to the water that's used, there's a big impact on the quality of the water. And 40% of U.S. waterways are impaired by manure that's mostly runoff from factory farms. But even when animals are allowed to graze in wild areas, they can have a really horrible impact on these waterways. They trample them and dredge up sedimentation and leave behind manure and a lot of things that can really degrade the habitat for the wildlife who, who need these waterways. Okay, next slide. And then there's been increasing attention, and rightfully so, on the impacts of meat and dairy production on climate change. Studies have found that even if the energy sector went climate neutral tomorrow, if we don't start to change what we eat, we still won't meet global climate goals. And that's because meat and dairy production are responsible for more than 16% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And that's really an outsized chunk of agricultural emissions as a whole. They account for about half of all agricultural emissions. And a big piece of that comes from methane. And this is, as we've heard, you know, politicians joke about it, that it's cow burps and farts. And, and that is a big part of it. A lot of it has to do with how cattle digestive systems work. But methane also comes from the manure of all, uh, of all farmed animals. And methane is a really important greenhouse gas emission to pay attention to because it's what's known as a short-lived climate pollutant. So it doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long as carbon dioxide, but it's much more potent for the time that it is in the atmosphere. And that means that when we are emitting a lot of methane, we are accelerating climate change, 
but it also provides an excellent opportunity because when we're able to reduce the amount of methane that's being emitted, such as by reducing the amount of meat and dairy that's being produced, we are able to more rapidly uh, to see some of these more immediate uh, um, reductions in global warming. Um, next slide. And then the last major impact that I want to talk about is uh, meat and dairy production's impact on biodiversity. Of course, everything that I've talked about so far has an impact on wildlife, but there are also a lot of direct threats to wildlife. Um, there's a program in USDA that's called Wildlife Services. It's pretty secretive, doesn't have great oversight, and it kills about a million native animals every single year, mostly to protect the interests of meat and dairy producers. And these aren't just animals like wolves and coyotes and grizzly bears that may prey on the on the farmed animals. It also includes animals like um, like prairie dogs who are killed because their burrows can create hazards for grazing cattle. The cattle step in them and injure themselves. And so thousands and thousands of prairie dogs are killed every year so that grazing cattle don't get hurt. Um, we also know that there are about 175 endangered species. These are um, wild species who are already in trouble, and they're further imperiled just by the presence of livestock on public lands. And that's in addition to, um, you know, the threats, whether these animals are directly targeted for removal, there are further threats by things like when cattle, you know, when they, when they stomp on the ground, they can destroy burrows. They, uh, when they chew, when they eat the grass, they have a different impact on it than native uh, grazing animals. And a lot of times they chew the grass even shorter, which means that all of these species who have um, relied on tall grasses for things like protection from predators no longer have that protection. Um, when there are cattle grazing, there's also a lot of fencing that comes along with that that can cut off wild animals from, from water sources and give um, predators, especially um, birds of prey, a place to prey, uh, perch and attack more uh, of the smaller endangered species. So there are just a lot of ways that, that just the presence of cattle and grazing and land that is, uh, that is targeted for that can have an impact on wildlife. And sometimes we hear things where people look at some of the land, particularly out west and say, well, it's not good for anything else. This isn't a place where we can grow crops, but of course it is good for something else. This is wild habitat that we're talking about. And much of what we've been talking about so far is on land, but it's also important to note that seafood has many of the same um, impacts that we're talking, that we've been discussing so far. Um, aquaculture is basically like wet factory farms. There are a lot of similar concerns having to do with pollution and runoff and what the fish in aquaculture um, facilities are being fed. And then when you get into wild caught, I know a lot of people are familiar that uh, with the idea of overfishing, that a lot of fish species have been caught beyond sustainable levels. There's also an issue with bycatch. And that's when um, in commercial fisheries, they use these massive nets to pretty much catch everything. But out of everything they're catching, there's only a relatively small number of targeted species that they plan to send to market. And everything else that's caught up in there is just considered collateral damage. And that includes a huge amount of marine mammals who are killed as bycatch. The next slide. And just this slide just illustrates really how little um, biodiversity is valued in this industry in that grasshoppers are killed, that they aren't eating grass to save that grass for cattle instead. So from grasshoppers up to iconic species like wolves, um, meat and dairy production is is really has a huge impact on on biodiversity and, and the environment. Um, next slide. So in comparison, um, I know we've already talked about a lot of these uh, these benefits from plants uh, that grow in growing plants compared to uh, meat and dairy production. Uh, but in addition to the environmental benefits, a couple that I really want to point out. One of them is that first one of not having zoonotic diseases. Um, by definition, zoonotic diseases like SARS and, um, and other coronaviruses are passed from animals to people, not from plants to people. And even when it comes to foodborne illnesses, a lot of times when you see things like a recall for spinach, it's not the plants themselves, it's because of the manure that was sprayed on those plants that led to the, um, the bacterial exposures there. So 
So there are a lot of human health benefits as well to eating more plant-based foods, as well as benefits, of course, to the animals themselves um, and to workers, because factory farm and slaughterhouse jobs are among the most dangerous um, jobs in the world. Uh, next slide. And so what about grass-fed beef? We often hear this, this question or the statement, it's not the cow, it's the how. But the truth is, it's really the how many. There are simply too many people eating too much meat for any form of production to be truly sustainable. There are absolutely better and worse ways to raise animals. And there are a number of practices that can benefit, of course, the animals themselves and have a much lighter impact on the environment. But those are only possible if, as a whole, we're able to reduce the amount of meat and dairy that we eat. Otherwise, I mean, there's simply not enough existing pasture land in this country. And if we try to expand beyond that pasture land, then we are getting into destroying more habitat, which starts to cancel out not only um, the benefits of the wildlife who need that habitat as home, but also um, that, that cancels out the climate benefits of those grasslands. Okay, next slide. And so this is just one example um, of a comparison. That's the Beyond Burger. That's a pea protein plant-based burger compared to the beef burger. And you can see there are just huge savings across all the environmental metrics that were measured. Um, next slide. And we also see similar savings when it comes to milk products. I know sometimes there's a tension on uh, the amount of water that almonds require. And compared to other plant uh, crops, they are fairly thirsty, but you can see that it's still a much smaller water footprint compared to dairy. And if that is a concern, whether, you know, because of the water that goes into almonds or allergies, there are so many other options out there. And this, of course, is not just for milk. There are a lot of other products that are available now um, that are alternatives to dairy in milk and cheese and, um, and yogurts and all of those other um, options as well. Uh, next slide. Um, if you're interested in a few more meal comparisons, um, particularly with greenhouse gas emissions, you can check out this website, Meals for Planet. It's out of UCLA. And, um, and one thing that I want to point out on this slide is that the pumpkin and mushroom risotto, the original recipe didn't have any meat in it, but it did have dairy in it. It had milk, uh, butter, and cheese added to it. And so you can see that there's still a fairly significant um, savings in greenhouse gas emissions when, when the dairy was swapped out. And that's just something to think about because a lot of times when people first start eating vegetarian, sometimes they increase their dairy. And if you are concerned about the impacts on the planet, that's something that you'll want to pay attention to. Um, next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk about a bunch of different actions that everybody can take to start to make these changes. But first, I want to talk about why these changes matter because I've thrown out some very big numbers out there, and sometimes it can feel daunting or overwhelming, and you're not sure that what you actually eat or the choices you make in your day-to-day -day life matter. And there are several reasons why they do. And the first one is, is simply aligning your lifestyle with your values, being the ch change that you want to see in the world. Um, and that's just something that's on a personal level. But when you do that, you start to set an example for others. and this doesn't mean that, you know, when you go out to eat with your friends, when, you know, in the post-pandemic world, it doesn't mean that you are setting them down to have a lecture about what they're eating, but it does mean that, like, people notice what you eat. And sometimes they'll ask questions, sometimes they'll just think that your dish looks really good, and they start to see what it can be both to live according to your values, as well as, you know, values aside, just how delicious plant-based foods can be. And then the more that we eat those, we're building market demand. One of the great things about food is that we as individuals have a lot of control every time we sit down to eat over what it is that we're going to, uh, what kind of food system we're going to support. And that sends feedback back into the market for what retailers and restaurants will offer and, and ultimately what will be grown and produced on farms. Um, of course, none of this happens in a bubble. There are a lot of policies that also influence what's, uh, what's grown, things like subsidies and um, and, and things like that. And it's also important to note that we don't all have the same choices um, due to different policies and inequities. Some people have more access to fresh, healthy foods than others. And but when we start to build that market demand and when we start to kind of shift the culture of how people think about food, that helps create a lot of cover for those policies to start to change. Uh, next slide. 
Um, so this is just, you know, a quick stat on what that, if everybody in the U.S. made these significant reductions in their beef consumption in particular because of the high climate impact and other plant-based foods, um, we would be saving a lot of greenhouse gas emissions over the next decade. Um, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about how to do this. I'm by no means suggesting that everybody should, you know, leave this webinar and go become vegan. If you do, that's great. I mean, the fewer plant, the fewer um, meat and dairy products that you eat, the more of a plant-based diet that you have, obviously the better environmental savings that will occur. You're, you have a much lower footprint, the fewer meat and dairy products that you're eating. But you can have a huge impact even by making relatively small changes. And the important thing is that this should be a, you know, something that you think about as a long-term uh, life lifestyle change if you are looking to green your diet. And so you might want to start out with swapping ingredients and really start with what's easy. Maybe you're not ready to give up bacon in the morning, but maybe you don't care what kind of milk goes into your coffee. So start with trying out plant-based milks. It's okay to start off one ingredient at a time. You can also start by moving meat from the center of the plate to being more of a side dish or condiment. So maybe instead of having you know, a big steak with a small side salad, you're having a really colorful, fresh stir fry that has a little bit of meat in there as flavor. You can also go one meal or one day at a time, um, whether that is starting with a meatless Monday or, um, you know, or deciding that you're going to eat plant-based at lunch, but not dinner. Um, once you make these changes, um, I'd also recommend asking for greener menus everywhere that you go. Again, back to that idea of the, the culture shift is the more that plant-based foods are available everywhere, the more normalized it becomes for everybody to start making the greener choice in their diets. So think about all of the places you are where food is being served. And that you know, could be restaurants you go to, um, the schools that you are involved in, either that your kids go to, that are in your district, or maybe where you teach. Um, events, once events are happening again, those menus can make a big difference. So even when you RSVP as an event attendee, you can let those organizations um, that you're supporting know that you want plant-based options. And then any uh, companies and organizations that you are involved in, um, they can adopt a plant-based policy so that they're purchasing for, whether it's company lunches or events that they're putting on, that they're purchasing more sustainable foods. Um, and then there are a lot of different uh, public venues and government purchases that happen and programs that can support more sustainable diets. And the government programs are, you know, not just ones that have to do with what they're actually purchasing, but sometimes that can be things like, you know, offering to help with a, um, a sustainable cooking class at, you know, through the community center and things that can help other people again adopt this lifestyle. And then next slide. And then one other piece that I wanna pay quick attention to is food waste. And that's because there's about 40% of the food that's produced in the United States never gets eaten. And I believe the number in central Ohio is that there's about a million pounds of food every day that's just thrown out. And of course, that's a terrible waste of food and it's a waste of money. You know, whatever you put into buying that food, you're just throwing that out too. But it's also a waste of all of those resources we talked about earlier that go into producing food. And so it's a really great way to have a greener diet to make sure that you're actually eating what you purchase. Um, and these are a bunch of steps that you can take to, um, to try to reduce your food waste and, and pay more attention to, to what, you're, what you're purchasing um, and how you're using it. The next slide. Just a few more minutes. Uh, yep, and this is the last slide I believe we're at. Yep. So this is the last slide, and and this goes back to um, you know to the to the local aspect of this. One thing that's important to note is that local food on its own is not a, a climate solution. Um, there was a study that looked at food miles and found that eating less meat and dairy just one day a week actually saves more greenhouse gas emissions than eating an entirely local diet. But there are a lot of great reasons to choose local, and that includes things like supporting your local economy and um, you know and supporting a smaller regional food system and that of course also includes growing your own food which diane gave a lot of great examples about which you know not only has that great uh you know re reframing of fast food as being you can go outside and get your food but that's also a way to um, increase access to food and increase food sovereignty so that everybody has access to you know these amazing fresh uh 
fruits and vegetables and other and other foods that you can produce on your own. And I will end it there so that we can take some questions. Great, thank you, Stephanie. And I, I wanted to mention real quick, um, the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio has speared up a Save More Than Food campaign. So you can kind of go online and see what they're doing. And then also, on uh, if you're looking for a Facebook forum, there's a group called CBUS Vegan Eats. And it's people just post in their, their recipes in restaurants in town. Like Columbus has dozens of vegetarian and vegan restaurants. So let's go ahead. I know that we have some um, questions here. So I want to get to those. Let's see. And there's a number of resources that are in the chat. Uh, I wanted to point out that uh, uh, Diane and I think Stephanie, you have put put in there. There's also a video of uh, Franklin Park Conservatory, Bill Dawson, how to kind of lay out a box garden. So um, this might be a question for another another uh, green spot conversation, but would love to learn how to grow microgreens is the question. So is there a resource, uh, Stephanie or Diane, uh, or a website or something like that where uh, this person can get some more information about how to grow microgreens? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just started because of the things I had, like trying to use my mushroom containers. And so, um, you know, just getting some, starting with some organic potting soil um, that doesn't have peat in it because of that resource as well. And so just looking at different resources that way that I could just start with a small thing under a little light that has to stay on in the house anyways. So I just started and then, you know, looking at reputable companies, again, I support companies that are, you know, producing organically or heirloom wise, or maybe have diesel uh, converted their trucks to biodiesel or, you know, I'm really interested in supporting those kinds of companies that are doing that kind of thing. But if you can do it locally, you can be sharing those seeds. I grow them now in my own garden. So I have my own microgreens during the winter. Right. Thank you. Um, and I noticed that you put your email in the chat, so I think everybody has that information. If there's other questions, go ahead and write them in the chat. I thought I saw one other one, but I might have missed it. Um, and while, while people are thinking about that, I know we're over time, but I figured it's a great conversation, so let's keep it going if people could hang around. Uh, one thing, um, Stephanie, when you're talking about like the meat industry and the dairy industry, um, I, I, in my mind, I was almost comparing it to like the coal industry, because out here in, in Ohio, coal is, even though it's, it's, it's shrinking, it still has a lot of influence and we still use a lot of coal. And at the federal level, they're working to transition coal miners to more sustainable jobs. Uh, I think the, the United Coal Miners uh, Union is just signed on to, uh, uh, into basically transitioning. Uh, their members to cleaner sources of energy. And it's almost kind of like, I kind of see like a similar thing with like the meat and dairy industry where uh, the workers can, uh, if they want to, can be retrained. Uh, obviously we need like the federal government to kind of help with that transition, but it's kind of a win-win with workers and with environment. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that you brought that up because we do need that same, you know, they often talk about it as a just transition and we need that same thing in agriculture as well. You know, we don't want to leave the folks who have been raising animals for food in a lurch. Like we definitely want to make sure that people can continue to farm, continue to pr produce food, just different foods. So it is going to take some government support to help, you know, provide the funds and the training and the other resources that are needed to help people transition what it is that that they're growing. But you know, there can be huge advantages to switching to to plant based foods. Absolutely, I do want to point out for folks and. Those that are green spot members or, or non members, one of the commitments that you could choose is eating less meat. So you're basically going vegetarian or vegan for one or two days a week uh, and kind of growing it from there. I had one person say, Dave, I wish, you know, they have like the meatless Mondays and I hate that because if anything, it should just be maybe one day where you eat meat. And so the other six days you're going vegetarian or vegan, but it's like, you know, if, if somebody can do that, that's great. Uh, like I'm a vegetarian, still working on the, being a vegan thing, uh, but it's like knowing where you are and taking those steps uh, to get to where you want to go. Uh, there is a, a question uh, for you, Diane, about uh, did you rototill 
uh, the turf or soil or use cardboard to kill the grass or what? Yeah, I don't, um, it's a no-till garden um, so that I don't kill the microbes in the soil. Um, there's a, a lot with the micro rhizomes in the, in the earth that are creating that health and resiliency that we want to disturb the least for it, but with heavy clay soils. So what I did again, you know, this, there are many ways to do it, but I just, I use several thick layers of newspaper followed by cardboard that was all wet and then just use the leaf mulch because that's what I had and that's what I used to, to snuff out the grass underneath and to create those first beds. So ideally it's nice if you can do that, you know, in the spring so it's ready for a fall planting or in the fall so that it, you know, has time to break down for a spring planting. But I've also just, you know, that's when I could get it done. So I've, I did those layers and then just poked holes right through everything and put my plants right right down and through there through the into the soil and then that will help eliminate a lot of the weeds from coming up and keep the moisture in the soil so there's less need to water as well. Fantastic and um, so I know again that any one of these topics we could probably talk for another hour or two on and hopefully what these green spot conversations do for the people who are viewing this is pique your interest to get more information. So uh, you can always email greenspot at columbus.gov. We can kind of connect you to the right people. Uh, Diane and Stephanie uh, have their information there. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for uh, being part of this and thank our, our presenters for covering this important topic. And we'll have more of the Green Spot conversations. We, I think we have about three or four that are in the making right now. Uh, and we'll be making an announcement of when those will, will be. Uh, oh, before I forget, I always forget something. Um, our backyards program, the Green Spot Community Backyards program starts May 1st. So that's pretty, what, Saturday? <laughs> and what that program is, it's administered by Franklin Soil and Water Conservation District, but we offer uh, rebates on $50 rebates on uh, native trees, native uh, uh, plants. I think the rebate for the native plants might be a little bit less than 50, but still significant and uh, a native or native rain barrel, a rain barrel. So you can get up to $50 off one of those categories. And even if you've taken advantage of the program in the past, you can take advantage of it uh, this time too. For the plants, it's native plants, so it's not vegetables, but still you can always buy those native plants and help out our, our native pollinators. So uh, with that, I uh, wanna thank everybody and special thanks to Stephanie and Diane. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and Stop recording. So have a good night, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.